everyone, back to another Voice of a Generation, and today my special guest is none other than Mr. Willie J. Tony, right here in Prince William County. I'm so excited to talk with him, learn more about his plight, his story, and how he came to be a resident here in Prince William County. So let's welcome Mr. Willie J. Tony to PW Perspectives, Voices of a Generation. Welcome, Mr. Tony. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm so happy to have you here today. I have so many questions for you. <laughs> well, I can answer them. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. Um, you and I have been knowing each other for a very long time. So this feels like just friends chatting it up. Right. right, um, right. I respect you as a pillar in the community and as an elder, um, as a mentor. And so I'm honored to have the opportunity to talk with you today. Well, this is mutual. Um, I recall my first uh, interaction with you when you were, uh, were working hard to feed the homeless. Yeah. You know, and you got a lot of folks involved, myself yeah. included, and I think that has helped us bond because you, as I do, have a passion for helping people. Absolutely. So we share that. Absolutely. We definitely do share that. And you're right. That is actually how we met <laughs> out there in the community. You are, um, since I've known you've been a man of service. You've been a man that's been serving our community, and that has not stopped. And here I am interviewing you um, for our uh, uh, our Voice of a Generation um, series, and I'm thinking like he never really seemed old enough that I would be sitting here <laughs> having this conversation with him now. But you've lived a very full life. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I've been blessed yeah. many times. Yeah, and I just recently asked you, I said, you know, what's your age? Because, you know, I, I don't see you as that the age that you are, 72, if it's okay for me to say. Um, but, you know, because you have this youthful spirit, you know, you're always supercharged and ready to get into the fight. And, um, and I, it's, it's something for people like myself to look at and to look up to, um, to know that even at your age, you're still very passionate about changing the lives that you come across and impacting your community. And I think that's something that I always will be thankful for, to really have that opportunity to see you lead the way in that. Well, sometimes the mantle is passed to you and you, know, you just have to take it up. Um, particularly when you see the needs and that you see that you can have some impact on it. It's just a matter of of just having the energy to go forward, you know, working with people to improve their quality of life. And it also improves you, yeah. you know, uh, as you do that. You yeah. know, uh, being benevolent is a, I think it's a two-way thing. You know, you give it, but you also receive it. Absolutely. So um, every day um, I look back and kind of see how the day has gone, and I'm, I try to be satisfied. Yeah. You know, some days is better than others, as with anybody. But um, I try to think that I'm here to, try to help somebody. I'm not here to be malicious and in any way try to bring anything negative to anybody. That's not my goal or intent at all. Mm -hmm. If I see I can help you, then I will. Yeah. And I think that has helped me because people have helped me along the way and I think it's reciprocal. It goes around, as they said. So um, that's who I try to be. Yeah. You know? yeah. That's who I try to be. Well, it shows. It does. <laughs> it shows. You're well known in the community, especially throughout Dumfries here in Prince William County, and um, and I know that you your work, it, it stands far, far past Prince William County. Um, people know you throughout Fairfax County and beyond. Um, so it definitely shows the work that you're doing. So speaking of that, when I look back, um, you know, at the work that you've done in the community, you've been at this for a long time. But I really want to know how, how little Willie Tony, <laughs> those the earlier years, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what it was like um, growing up, you know, as a little Willie Tony, and where did you grow up at? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I was originally born in South Carolina okay. on a sharecropper's farm. Uh, I was the first of my, my mother's, I'm the first child. My mother and father, uh, well, my father, he got killed when I was four. So, and my sister was born the next day. Goodness. So, 
me and my mom, we kind of bonded. She told me I, I said some things to her then. I was little, but I don't really remember. But, uh, I told her, I said, Mama, don't worry, I'll take care of you. You know, uh, so all my years, I've tried to do that. And uh, I think for the most part, she left me about six years ago. Went on to heaven to be with her husbands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think I've done that, you know. I was, I always felt that she was, I'd say, proud of the things that I had done, the things that I were doing. Um, she, I would always kind of send a little note say, hey mom, here's another reason to smile, ah. you know. So, um, you know, she kind of instilled it in me, that, uh, you, you, you will do something with your life, you know. Uh, after, he, after my father passed, we stayed in South Carolina for another four years, then we moved to Wilmington, North Carolina. That is where I actually grew up, um, running in the streets and learning how to hang, hang in the city. Uh, Playing ball, sports, and that kind of thing with other folks, bonding with other folks. I mean, some of those guys, man, we're still friends to this day. Our friendship, and I speak to them regularly. Since the advent of the cell phone, you know, it's just a matter of hitting the button. So a couple of those guys, we're still very close. We speak to each other quite frequently. But along the way, um, you know, you learn about yourself. You learn about yourself with, as you associate with, with other friends. Um, you know, sometimes you see that you might be a better athlete than this one or. I know sometimes I could think a little quicker than this one, yeah. so, you know, those things uh, did not escape me as I was growing up. Um, in the schools, they had the tracking system, you know, you, if you was with a, you know, back in those days, um, like, for example, we would have, like, 10 classes, 1A1, 1A2, 1A3, mm -hmm. by the time you got to 1A10, those kids were, you know, they were, yeah. you know, <laughs> shop, but uh, I was all, always in the threes. Yeah. And finally, I made it into the twos. And I mean, everybody kind of, you know, you grew up in a small town. Everybody knew everybody and you respect everything. Um, I was playing, playing, all of us were sports minded. Mm -hmm. Playing, uh, well, my main sport was uh, football. I was a quarterback of our high school team. Um, didn't start, but I was there. I was the last one to play when the school was closed in the integration back in 60, 1968. Uh, they were doing something to, I like that. They planning something this summer to uh, bring those kids back that uh, didn't get a chance to graduate from that school. But along the way, you ask, um, teachers start pointing things out to my mother and to me. Mm -hmm. So I started, uh, you know, recognizing that, you know, because I, I started reading really early. That was the other thing. That's the number one thing I think that really kind of pushed me out in front. I was reading at five, six. I mean, I was reading. I mean. Relatives used to say, Man, we thought you were going to be crazy. <laughs> I used to read. I was a voracious reader. Really? And, and from that standpoint, I learned a lot about, I used, to, I used to like to read autobiographies, you know, about people who achieved things, who kind of had an idea of themselves. And, and one of the, the most influential one was the autobiography by Winston Churchill. Somebody might have said, uh, uh, Malcolm X, but no, I was in. Eighth grade, I read the autobiography of, Mel, of um, Winston Churchill, and he believed in predestination. He was a poor man, born a commoner, but he believed in himself. He said, I'm going to be the Prime Minister of England. Everybody laughed at him. And uh, he eventually was. Yeah. So, but uh, he ascended those levels. So as I started growing, I started kind of thinking, I said, maybe I'm here for something special. You know, so I would take risks. A lot of friends wouldn't. And, I mean, what's wrong with you, man? But I would do things, and a lot of times I would be able to achieve those things, you know. And that sort of fuel that, that ego of mine made me think that I could do a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm thinking the eighth grade, the um, governor of North Carolina at that time was a dude by the name of Sanford. He started something called the North Carolina Advancement School, where they was picking kids from all over the state to come to this school. Mm -hmm. For um, advanced, before you know, extra advanced courses mm -hmm. and study. So I was me and eight other my classmates. We went to there. I think we stayed in Winston Salem. I'm from Winston, Winston Salem Advanced School from February to the end of March to the end of May to the school year. And so while I was there, also I saw there that my skills were like, man, I was just as good particularly on sports, but also in the academics. I was, 
you know, placing high on that, um, on that level these kids. There was 300 of them. So those things further fueled me. When I got back, they moved me up a level. I went to the twos then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, um, and, my, and I had the respect of my, uh, my colleagues and classmates. They knew, you know, I was, when I came in there, if the teacher wanted an answer, she said, all right, Tony, give me an answer. So it was like that when yeah. I was in school. Plus, I was out in the streets and running with some quasi-thug kind of dude. So I had, you know, <laughs> I had that kind of a, a dual experience. Yeah. You know, academic, I was tight, but I also ran with the dudes who were strong in the streets. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I wasn't being bullied. Uh, yeah. In fact, I kept them from doing a lot of things. Doing that. We talk about that quite a bit now. One of my friends, and I hope I'm not ready. I mean, he, we was talking, he said, boy, I taught you how to fight. I said, no, I taught you how to read. <laughs> he laughed and said, you know, you're right. But either way, we all grew up and nurtured each other, um, played ball. And then by the time I became a junior in high school, I had another um, extraordinary thing happen to me. I was selected to attend the Yale University Summer High School. Oh, this changed my life. I mean, that. That was the first time I ever flew on a plane, the first time um, I met people other than black and white people. Went to this school in New Haven, Connecticut. There was 100 students there. We were from all over the country. You had Native Americans, looked like Tonto. I had never seen that. Puerto Ricans, we had, uh, uh, I mean, white folks, black folks from all walks of life. It was from all over the country. San Antonio, uh, or Washington State, uh, Colorado. I mean, um, and that was amazing. I, when I used to wonder why I was there, because some of those kids were brilliant. I mean, they could do things. Um, I, I guess I was just a well-rounded dude, but I didn't have, I wasn't super at anything, but I was maybe a little above average in a few. Yeah. But <laughs> some of these kids were, I mean, fantastic. Actors. Um, there, I quarterback our successful football team. Um, also, that's where I started singing at. <laughs> you and I shared that. So we had a band there, me and uh -huh. a friend of mine, we, we had guys who could play by ear, you know what I mean? Yeah. These guys were talented, you know, so I um, stepped up there and all the temptations and the smoking rocks yeah. back in them days, I had them down. I, I was an entertainer at that point. Did that for quite a while. Uh, but also, something changed me. There's something called a community review board. They had three students, three teachers, and three administrators. It was like a quasi-court. And for some reason, they elected me to serve on that. That was my first time being elected to anything. And the main person there was an attorney, one of the administrators. So he made sure that we had bylaws and followed Robert's rules and that kind of thing. That was my first time being. Yeah. I, mean, I was 16 at the time. Wow, I'm getting introduced to this. So, we had some real serious incidents that we had to adjudicate also during that time. So I'm, I'm growing, you know, and uh, I didn't really realize it to what extent until I came back. We was there two years, two summers. Final summer, I went to 67 and 68. My mother called me. I'm the returning quarterback of my team. And everybody in town know me. I'm anxious. Called me and said, your school is closed. The Supreme Court had told the state that if y'all they had, they had issued the, the creed to desegregate the schools anyway. Mm -hmm. So, um, they integrate the schools. So, um, but North Carolina was slow. So they finally said, that you don't integrate these schools, then we're not gonna give you any educational money. So this thing came abrupt, you know, and so they didn't have um, a whole lot of plans in place. Uh, in fact, like I said earlier, they are dealing with that issue now, as we speak, trying to, um, I don't know, compensate for mm -hmm. what they took from us back then by having a, a graduate ceremony this coming summer. Mm -hmm. But when we got back, we were thrown to the school. The school was two years old mm -hmm. that we had to attend. So um, this, again, is when someone called my mother, they asked my mother could they come and pick me up. And I'm saying, Mom, she said, well, my mother always pushed me. I'd be saying, yeah. oh. Get in that car and go, this was the, uh, the librarian, you know, she was the assistant principal of the new school. She was the, the 
former assistant principal of this integrated school, Hoggins, John T. Hoggins High School. So they started taking me to the Board of Education. I had never even, oh I'm looking at all these people up here, and these old folks. They say, well, how can we make this better? So they were asking my opinion. So, you know, um, Ms. Ms. Uh, Bar uh, Bond, that was her name, Ms. Bond, Ms. Uh, she has a book out. I think of her name is familiar. Okay. But the lady, she says, uh, just tell them what you feel, how you think that we can make this thing work. Because there was a lot of incidents going on in the school. A lot of, you know, the, uh, we didn't want to be there. And yeah. The kids didn't want us there. Sure. So we had a whole lot of incidents. The N word was thrown around and people were throwing fists and getting thrown out of school, this kind of thing. So we had to somehow come together, had to integrate and assimilate in such a way that, uh, you know, some of us could, could kind of make it, you know. So and they took a lot of my advice. I, I told them that for one thing, all of our officers had always been elected in the spring for the next coming year. You know, your junior class, your, your general um, student body president. But when we went to the school, they already had all that. So our folks, we were just out of it. Yeah. So I made a suggestion. So why don't we integrate it and um, um, have co-officers for this year? So they said, well, okay. They asked me to write. I'm serious. They asked me to write. This school is two years old. Write, make some amendments to their constitution. Wow. You know, so I took that thing home and I got some technical language together and wrote up and got all of our junior and senior officers. They became co, like co, co president, co vice president, co secretary, uh, co president for the student body, and then they had a big ceremony and inducted them all into. Uh, into uh, an office. And I remember I just learned they would be the recipient of all the their duties and responsibilities and authority in, uh, this, for that office. But that was my coming up to high school. Yeah. Boy, but you know, growing, going away every summer, always have to meet new people, like spending every summer. I went mean, to New Haven, I would leave there and I would go right, go down to Patterson, New Jersey, right outside New York yeah. City, and fun for about two or three weeks <laughs> before I came back home. But I learned some things about myself. Sure. Next year, I'd be down in Camden, New Jersey, right across the street from Philly. Yeah. So I would, and I, you know, I wasn't afraid to go out, go meet people. I always went to the playgrounds. <laughs> you know, like, damn, damn, they come, hey, country, what's going on? But they see you can play. Yeah. And they, you know, come on, country, on my team. What you doing tonight, country? Why don't you hang out with us? So meeting people came easy to me. You know, uh, I wasn't afraid of people and know when to be quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and know when to interject. But met some very, very good people along the way there. Yeah. But didn't realize that I was growing like I was. You know what I mean? Right. Um, those led me into my college years. But yeah. So, so I'm, I'm assuming that, that, I mean, that's just such a decorative story, mm -hmm. and um, it helps me to better understand, you know, uh, where you ended up, you know, like, I get it, um, foundation was laid, and it was laid very early, mm -hmm. um, so obviously your mom saw something special in you that, um, that, you know, caused her to push you yeah. out there, too. Like you have that. Sometimes I think we see that in our children. We see that thing, and we want to push them, push them for exposure. So with that being said, I mean, you tell this story, and I know you look at the youth today. Um, how important is exposure? I mean, I always felt that it had benefited me, and that leads me to um, when I at the college, I'm gonna jump forward. Mm -hmm. Um, I got a job working with uh, in Washington, D.C. as a youth director for this agency called the Southeast Neighborhood House. And when I moved to D.C. in 1976, and the gentleman whom I'll speak quite a bit about later on, who also had a large impact on my life, his name was Calvin Lockridge. He kind of tapped me and saw something in me too, and he asked me to come work with him. So I didn't know who the guy was, so I called around. He said, "Yeah, man." And at the time, he was the president of the DC school system. So anyway, uh, he helped me get a job 
And then, as I started moving in the community in the Southeast, it's warty for those who yeah. realize there were people that had not crossed the bridge this in 15, 20 years. I said, I couldn't believe that. You know, again, going back to exposure. So, uh, as the uh, director of youth programs, we had football, the basketball teams, um, along with a daycare center, all I was under my uh, direction, daycare, a youth council, um, um, some employment program and all that. We, we did all that. Mary Barry's program, um, but we was one of the, site, the sites where kids came with paid. But anyway, I took those teams and I made sure that they went across that bridge. I took them up to the Shaw area, I took them uptown to, you know, can they be so excited, man? I mean, again, exposure. I knew that exposure. Because if you know Washington, D.C., and Warty, it's almost like the Hatfields and the McCoys because there's a lot of hills. And so certain certain groups, they were fueling each other based on the fact that you live over there, and now you live down in Barrett Farms, and you're in Staten Terrace, you're in Douglas. But I mean, when we start pulling those kids and taking them out, and they were on the same teams, it created a whole different bonding. You know, and um, taking them out here in Virginia to play ball, and Maryland to play ball. These were like, you know, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Tweens, like 11, 12, 13 sure. year old kids, yeah. that, that age group. Pretty impressionable. Yeah, age. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, over the years, you know, uh, some of them came back and thanked me. Uh, one of the kids who ended up being a quarterback at Winston Salem State University. Mm -hmm. I taught him how to hold a ball, you know, all that, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, over the years, uh, I have had so many folks that would stop me and say thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, those things also fueled me and kept me going. You know, and uh, reinforce what I was doing. You know, so, but that thing gonna make that word exposure. I always knew that was part of it. You got to know that your your reach can exceed your grasp, or your grasp can exceed your reach, whatever. However that goes, but you you, it's not just here. You know, if it's not working for you here, you find the right place. You know, so that's why I would advocate and try to teach kids, and some listen. You know, and for the most part, a lot of them did. Came back and I thought, I guess those that didn't, they see me there slide on. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, okay, we, got, we all got those. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. and I started working kids, that was in 1976 yeah. when I got that done. In fact, before that, I was working at the Potomac Job Corps Center. Wow. But I was an R80, I didn't run anything. I sure. was just, they put me in a dormitory, a girls' dormitory, from 3 in the evening. To level the color, I had to put him in bed. Man, they set me up. But I got out of that unscathed. <laughs> I did get out of that unscathed. Yeah. Yeah. That was a learning experience. <laughs> so, you know, here he is, a country, country boy coming from the uh, deep south. Yep. Um, you have the exposure of being at Yale, this, this summer program. Um, and then you get your job, you come to the big city of DC. Now, that's, that's huge exposure. That's a culture shock in itself. Um, you dive into working with you. So how long did you stay in the D.C. area before you migrated down to Virginia? That's, that's a complicated story. <laughs> you know, the, the impetus that pushed me down here. But um, I worked with, the, um, with that program for two years. Okay. And then uh, Mr. Lockridge, he was an elected school board person. He asked me to come and become his um, assistant okay. at the Board of Education. He, he made it clear to me, he said, you're here to be my assistant. You're not the assistant board of manager, you're the assistant to the board manager. <laughs> so he always made that distinction. You're yeah. not the assistant board manager. Sure. Board member, now you're the assistant to the board member. But anyway, um, at that time, Ward 8, was the youngest census tract in America. The census tract is normally about 86,000 people. They had more, we had 22 elementary schools. And that, I'm not, if you know that area, the um, land mass is not very big. They had 22 elementary schools. <coughs> we had four junior high schools. And at that time, only one senior high school, that was Blue. So I gained access to those. But Mr. Lockridge was, was a no nonsense kind of person, very stern, very strict. Super brilliant, super brilliant man. 
Um, working with him was like going to grad school. Wow. I'm serious. I mean, uh, he had uh, graduated out of uh, Mohouse back in 55, had traveled Europe, uh, had gotten about, I think he had three masters, and they did work on two or three PhDs, but he was a brilliant man. Brilliant man. He could sit down and, I mean, talk about almost anything. And, and he allowed, when I was with him, honestly, I was quiet. Yeah. The kind of people that he would be engaging with, you know, um, and he would say, well, Tony, what's that number? And so I had to stop doing some of the things I was doing because I had to be, had to be able to pull things up, you yeah. know. I didn't have to go to paperwork. So I always listened, took notes, and when he needed something, I would try to regurgitate it for sure. him, you know, instantly. So those also taught me some things about myself. But um, let me see, from 76, uh, Mr. Ryder got married in 85, and he, he felt that he said, well, listen, I may not get reelected, so I'm going to help you get another job. So he got me a job. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Let me. The Board of Education had been tapped to start schools in the Lawton complex. I don't know if you remember, there are, there were eight different facilities down here in Lawton. So um, I was offered a job as a guidance counselor in one of the prisons. Oh. So this was at Lawton at the Occoquan facility. Sure. So I don't know if I came down there and, and commuted back and forth for years. Mm -hmm. And I ran into a young man, you and I both know, Mr. Cesar Roy, who yep. was doing some things down here who was very involved in the community and doing a lot of stuff, but also a singer. Yes. <laughs> so we said it. So uh, from time to time I would come and spend the weekend with him. Mm -hmm. And we'd get off and uh, get a whole lot of things. But I needed to get away from D.C. because things weren't going well for me there. Okay. The marriage was falling apart and I was really miserable. So eventually I just made the decision to leave everything that was there and came down here. That was in 92. So I lived in D.C. from 76 to 92. I think that was, what, 16 years, mm -hmm. something like that? Mm -hmm. I remember correctly. Um, I could go off into some other things, mm -hmm. but I, mm -hmm. I'll leave that side. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the divorce and all that, you know. Well, we're going to get to family. We're going to talk about family. Okay. I definitely mm -hmm. want to talk about the importance of family. Um, but so when you get down here, um, you start working here um, in Lorton. Mm -hmm. You're making that commute. So obviously a short commute. Mm -hmm. You've got some uh, connections here. You know some people. Um, an entertainer, fellow entertainer. Mm -hmm. So let's pivot into the entertainment because I've heard that come up a couple of times, mm -hmm. and I and I did share with you. I wanted to know a little bit about that. Um, I know that you're a singer, and those that are <laughs> viewing yeah. and reading may not know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you're talented. Uh, <laughs> you have many talents. You have many talents, and um, I'm learning more and more about them, but. Um, the singing, I know that you and, and uh, Mr. Al Brooks, um, who was also a singer. Yeah, he was, but see, he took it, I mean, he didn't, my performance, I really kind of ceased after high school. Ah. I would sing, you know, I would sing with groups, karaoke, and yeah. everything, and I enjoyed it, and yeah. we could sit down and harmonize with people, sure. um, just get up on a little karaoke stage and, you know, have fun, but with the band and practicing and all that, mm -hmm. after, um, went to college, I kind of ceased that. Plus, I saw my voice was changing a little bit then, too. Well, I didn't have the tenor that yeah. I had <laughs> because I was smoking them cigarettes. But, uh, and I had a nice little tenor when I was in high school. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, and, but, but, you know, I, I could sing, and, you know, based on the response from the people around me, it was okay. Yeah. I, was I knew how to hold a new, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So it was acceptable, uh, and I still do. You, you know? still do, yeah. Still that, do. That's the thing I want, I want people mm -hmm. to, to know that that you still do sing. You still, you may be, you know, <laughs>